everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Blesher from uh, Inside Surgical Hospital, Inside Family. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the uh, epidural fibrosis, uh, which is one of the uh, uh, common uh, uh, and avoidable complications after any surgery. And uh, what we are going uh, to talk about today, uh, just general overview, how is the epidural the, uh, fibrosis and scar happening, uh, how we diagnose it, uh, how the patient will uh, be presented after the surgery, uh, uh, what's the options for treatment, and uh, what's the outcome for, for the, uh, any intervention, and then the conclusion and the discussion, and we will end up with the, uh, with the question. So uh, as a patient, uh, when they have, uh, once they done with their spine surgery, the last thing that they wanna think about it, it's uh, another problem. So unfortunately, this is, as we said, it's unavoidable and it's gonna happen in any surgery. There's no way that you do surgery without a scar. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as a surgeon, uh, definitely I don't wanna see my patients suffer after I did the surgery for, for them. But uh, I'll say, fortunately, we can't blame scars for that, uh, for, for that problem. So what's the, uh, uh, how we can define the bureau fibrosis? So it's a replacement of the, uh, of the epidural fat and uh, around the spinal cord and, and the nerve root with the, uh, with the fibrous tissue that might compress the, the nerve and the core. How and why this fibrosis happen? So this is something that has been investigated uh, uh, why, since almost century. And uh, the first time uh, the post-operative fibrosis was uh, documented in the literature uh, about uh, 1936. At that time, Hodgkin, he found the uh, the first time uh, some adhesions and he called it uh, fibrinolytic uh, fibrin, fibro, uh, uh, fibrosis. And uh, at that time, they don't know exactly how is that uh, fibrosis happened. So why and how some patients, they will end up with ugly scar like that and why the others, they have normal healing. So that's where we got to talk a little bit about the, uh, some uh, molecular histology here. So after any injury, we, we have activation of a lot of uh, uh, active uh, cells like macrophages, uh, platelets, lymphocytes, and, uh, and other, other cells that will release a lot of cytokines and proteins that will activate the uh, uh, fibrogenesis, which is well uh, stimulate, uh, which is will make more fibroblasts, and uh, that will end up with the uh, extracellular um, uh, matrix, which is either will be uh, remodel re will be remodeling and uh, end up with a normal healing, or would, or if that's nothing happened will end up with the scar. So as you see on, this, on, the, uh, on the screen, there should be an imbalance between the two pathways. If that balance broken in any point in any of those uh, uh, checkpoints, the, the, the scale will be leaned toward one side, which we favor toward the healing. But till now, so, nobody knows why some patients, they will end up with the with that ugly scar and why the others, they have normal, normal healing. And in the same, that those checkpoints, a lot of researchers, they're using them uh, when we're gonna talk about the prevention, like they're trying to modulate a couple of uh, medications or uh, preventive measures to tackle those small, uh, either uh, cytokine, cytokines or, uh, or, uh, or proteins, to trying to delay any or to prevent any uh, fibrosis. How's the uh, 
patient will come uh, to, to, the, to my office after the surgery, how they're gonna present it with this uh, scar. So most of the patients, they will be having uh, what they call the uh, back pain that uh, having a radicular pain, which most of the time it's the same distribution of the, uh, of the pain from, from either from the previous uh, uh, herniated disc that we did the surgery for, or it could be an, another uh, different dermatomes. So most of the uh, epidural fibrosis, it's benign and doesn't always cause any pain. But on the other hand, like uh, they say almost like third of the uh, quarter of the, what it called the FPSS, which is the failed back surgery syndrome, it's blamed on the uh, epidural fibrosis. So the, the first thing we have to know which of which, is it real epidural fibrosis or is it, uh, or is it uh, an, something else? There's some, some they believe there's, there's no pain could be caused by the, uh, by the epidural fibrosis because they claim it, this is a just normal healing and any case they will have some sort of scar around the nerve root and around the, uh, and around the spinal cord. And they all, they, they, uh, all who's claiming that way, they say you have to search for something else other than the, uh, don't blame it, the fibrosis for that. And that's what they're trying to, to make that syndrome. As we know, like once we don't know exactly what the pathway of that disease, we just call it syndrome. It's just collective um, problems that they share common uh, presentation. So uh, usually that syndrome, they either, could be related to a new uh, recurrent uh, herniated disc, could be complication from the, uh, uh, from the previous surgery, either failed uh, uh, hardware uh, fusion, could be uh, pseudoarthrosis, it could be adjacent uh, segment disease, or it could be, was, was wrong diagnosis that we did the surgery for, for herniated uh, disc, but patient also they had could be dystrogenic pain or could be uh, facet arthropathy. So the, uh, or could be wrong procedure. And uh, some, they also, uh, they, some patients, they will just have a myofascial pain. So all of that is making the diagnosis, definitive diagnosis for the, for the epidural fibrosis is a little bit challenging. So what's, what we have, the, uh, the diagnosis of the, uh, that of the epidural fibrosis, it's mainly, we have the uh, gold standard, it's the uh, uh, contrast enhanced MRI. And, uh, and that's giving the upper hand, uh, it's non-invasive, it can differentiate between the, uh, the, the scar or if there's any new uh, herniated disc. And uh, that's how we can see it on the, before the, we give the contrast and after the, uh, the contrast, you can tell if it's herniated disc or if it is a, a scar around the nerve root or around the, uh, the core. As you see like uh, here, there's a couple of slides trying to point about uh, before you get the contrast and after how that uh, will enhance the, uh, the fibrosis. And even some, uh, now you can control with the uh, MRI sitting, you can do the fat suppressions that will make the fibrosis more clear. And uh, there's a couple of the uh, uh, research they trying to uh, see which is better. Is it the uh, MRI? Is it uh, diagnostic? Could we miss anything? So the other, the other, uh, the other modality that we can use it's the uh, endoscopy of the of the epidural space. And there is a couple of literature they they 
they say there is no difference between uh, between uh, the MRI and the uh, and the endoscopy in the diagnosis. But the other, they say uh, you have it's diagnostic and therapeutic if you want to use the uh, endoscopy. So how how we know how much we have fibrosis? Uh, that's been uh, there is a ROS grading model that has been used since 1998. And how that happened, they did the three sections around the, uh, around the uh, hernia, around the disc level, and they, met, they divided in four quarters and they check how much, in, uh, how much fibrosis or scar in that quarter. And they will classify it into four grades. And most of the studies, they say, there is good correlation between the uh, symptoms that the patient they will present with, with how much you can see of uh, fibrosis on the MRI. And uh, here's a couple of uh, 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 literature that support that. And they say, especially in the first 18 months, you, uh, the MRI, uh, Correlation, it's high for the uh, for the bus of uh, symptoms that the patient they will have. So, how we can prevent the uh, this this fibrosis? There is a lot um, of trials, and uh, uh, it's been investigated since uh, the first time when we diagnosed the post-operative uh, adhesions and the first uh, preventative. Uh, measures we used at that time, they used the uh, cargo membrane. And at that time, they used it mainly for, to prevent the peritoneal adhesion. But if we, when now we're talking about the spinal surgery, how, how much we have options to prevent, to prevent the uh, epidural fibrosis, we can classify them in three categories, which is, could be, which is proper surgical technique, what we call the Alstadian principle, or uh, mechanical barriers, or uh, chemical agents that we use topically after, uh, before we close the wound to, to prevent the future fibrosis. So what's the Alstadian principle? Principle. This is uh, being introduced in uh, of the surgery that uh, just the bas basic principle of any surgery: gentle tissue handling, meticulous uh, hemostasis, uh, preservation of blood supply, uh, aseptic technique, and uh, irrigation removal of any uh, dead bodies, and uh, minimal tension on the or meticulous handling of the uh, of the tissue and elimination of the dead space. So that's the basic for any surgery and that will decrease the risk of the fibrosis around the uh, nerve root. And there's a couple of literature they support um, either using the uh, wound vac, closed wound vac system after spine surgery or uh, or, or to now most of the surgeon trying to uh, go toward the uh, MIS surgery or uh, uh, using any uh, special techniques, what it called uh, with, uh, preserving the ligamentum flavum. So now that's for the principal general uh, proper surgical technique. What about the mechanical barriers? It's been, uh, a lot of trials to see what, what we can use to avoid the, the, that scar tissue to engulf the nerve root and to prevent it. The commonest and the oldest method that's been uh, using one of the organic barriers, which is the uh, free, fat, uh, free fat graft. And uh, it was in a couple of studies that shows that this is, uh, they have, Good outcome, and they checked it with the uh, with the MRI. When we do the post of MRI, and it shows there is the less fibrosis in the cases that being used. Uh, they use the fat, free fat graft for that. Uh, 
there, is, there is another, uh, as we say about the uh, preserving the ligamentum flavum, there is uh, about the synthetic barriers, there is a couple of, uh, now a couple of barriers that have been used all over the world, except in the U.S., it's not uh, it's not approved yet by the FDA by the FDA for for to be used on, uh, in the U.S. Even though uh, one of them, as you see in the, uh, uh, the uh, according to the International Adhesion Society, uh, the Atkin gel, it, uh, it it was in the U.S. market in the early ninety. Uh, it was in nineteen ninety six, and there were uh, uh, some financial issues with the with the company and uh, the FDA pushed them to uh, uh, to adjust their financial uh, status and then they end up with the bankruptcy. But it's still being used all over the world, and uh, it's a proof that uh, it prevent or decrease the chance of the uh, post-operative fibrosis. The other options that uh, it's being used uh, it's topical chemical agents like uh, NSAIDs, steroids, uh, someday even uh, they believe some anticoagulant can uh, do some uh, preventative measures uh, when it's used locally, uh, uh, fibrinolytic agents, uh, some local antibiotics and uh, a lot of uh, trials being conducted about the immunosuppressant that uh, has some rule because as uh, as we went through the uh, how the fibrosis happened when once we tackle any of those checkpoints that will affect the the scale toward the either healing or toward the scar so uh, there's also a trial of the using irradiation for uh, decrease the chance of the uh, fibrosis so now about the treatment, what's, what's the options uh, once we confirm and we diagnose the, uh, the dural fibrosis? There is, till this moment, there is no uh, clear effective uh, treatment measures and all the treatment modalities, it's, uh, it's mainly if we can prevent it, it's better than stuck with the epidural fibrosis and we couldn't get, uh, definitive treatment for that. So it's, it's a multi-approach uh, uh, treatment modality, which is, um, will provide some medications, physical therapy, psychological support, and definitely we can help with some intervention uh, uh, procedures. Couple of the procedures that uh, it's been, uh, published that the, uh, can help with the decrease the epidural fibrosis, which is mainly we're talking about here, the minim, uh, mineral invasive surgery, and it found it only can help in almost third of the cases. On the other side, some they claim the more you go after that scar, the more it's gonna happen in the future. So it's, uh, it's still debatable, should we, go after it. The, the more you go there, the more chance for the scar. The other modalities that we have, there is uh, bare cutaneous uh, adhesion, uh, adhesion lysis, uh, spine uh, epidural endoscopy, uh, neuro -modu modulations like the uh, uh, stimulators, that all can help the, the intensity of the pain after surgery. There's a couple of uh, literature support, uh, they, they found good outcome after the, uh, after the bureauscopy and they see here like on the left side uh, uh, image, they, they trying to look at the pain uh, six to 12 months after, after the uh, endoscopy procedure and they found there's, there's the decrease of the pain of, of those patients who's confirmed the uh, fibrosis. There's a couple of, uh, with, with the percutaneous uh, fibrolysis, a uh, couple of agents can be used 
uh, hypertonic saline, uh, uh, hyaluronic acid, steroids, all can be used as a chemical fibrillin lysis. And there is a couple of literature support uh, that. Uh, on the other side, for the endoscopy, it's mainly, uh, as we see here in the vector, it's mainly like the, the using the uh, catheter that goes in the sacral head is, and then they go, it's mainly mechanical uh, lysis of the uh, scar, either by using the uh, radio frequency or they, uh, or they use laser for that. And um, I'm trying, uh, I tried here to, uh, with the comparison between the two methods and what, what's uh, the support for each one of them. And both procedures, they carry a couple of complications, but the comments that we're talking about is the uh, uh, spinal cord, uh, the CSF leak, uh, which is documented to be more with the, uh, with the uh, percutaneous adhesive lysis. For the prognosis, as we said, there's, uh, there's no effective medical or surgical therapy for the epidural fibrosis. Our goal, it's mainly to improve the function of the patient, keep the patient comfortable uh, with, as we say, multimodal uh, pain uh, modality and to go back to normal life uh, as soon as possible. In conclusion, uh, as we said, and after any surgery trauma, that means there's a cut that's gonna be end up with a lot of uh, blood around the uh, spinal cord and the cord, and that's gonna end up with the uh, fibrosis. There is no uh, definitive uh, preventative tool uh, for prevention, no definitive treatment, but a lot of research uh, shows a promising future for uh, to come up with preventative tool that will help decrease the chance of the fibrosis around the uh, around the, uh, the nerve root and the core. And they expecting that, uh, that the global uh, adhesion uh, marker, uh, market will project it to be on the one of the competitive business market in the future. Here's a couple of the literature uh, that support a couple of the promising uh, future barrier or preventative tool for the uh, epidural fibrosis. As you say, the Atkins, it's been used uh, now more than 20 years all over the world. Uh, the other, uh, like in this uh, literature, it shows how is the, uh, the Atkins being used over two years they found, unfortunately, in this literature, they say no significant association between the uh, between the scar and the clinical outcome. Uh, another big uh, barrier that's been used, uh, something called Oxiplex. There's the it's been used uh, all uh, all over Europe now. Uh, still not approved in years to be used uh, for as a preventative tool for epidural fibrosis. A uh, couple of uh, in, in vivo trials uh, trying uh, different uh, collagen uh, substance that used for uh, as a barrier. Most most of the. Uh, Companies they try to come up with the what they call the ideal barrier, which is uh, uh, immunogen, uh, not immunogenic. It's uh, absorbable and uh, doesn't enhance the uh, the the scar formation and uh, stay in a place uh, for at least the first two weeks after the surgery. So to do the job of preventing the uh, the, the scar formation. Here they're trying uh, the Durogen. Uh, they, they say there, there is a significant decrease of the scar formation uh, in cases that uh, Durogen being used. Uh, in, in, this, in this study, they tried the cement and uh, they say it's, it's tried on the animals, still not uh, tried on, on, 
on, uh, in, uh, on the humans yet, but they say it's, uh, it could be promising safe uh, alternative for that. Uh, one of the other studies they're using the mesenchymal uh, uh, cell uh, to replicate the uh, umbilical cord to be used as a organic carrier. Um, this is a, to trying to support the use of local enzymes like uh, uh, diclofenic sodium and diltiazem uh, calcium channel blockers to have some role in decreasing the fibrosis after uh, the surgery. Uh, that's, uh, in this study, they conclude that the uh, application of, the, uh, of uh, this membrane will, will um, uh, decrease the chance of fibrosis. Low dose radiotherapy could be uh, helpful and decrease the uh, the chance of the fibrosis. And in this study, actually they say, uh, they claim because uh, we, we all know that the uh, uh, small dose of radiations that have been used uh, in the medical ward to decrease the chance of the ossification uh, after uh, like hip replacement surgery, or it's been used with the dermato dermatologist to decrease the chance uh, to treat the keloids. So they use the same theory for that in, the, uh, in this study. Here they're trying to, to compare one of the cytotoxic uh, antibiotic uh, um, uh, MMC with the 5-fluorouracil and they found the MC has the better decreasing the chance of the fibrosis after the surgery, uh, after the surgery was done in, uh, in, in vivo. Uh, as I say, there's a couple of uh, chemical agents being used. One of them, uh, hormones uh, like uh, tamoxifene, uh, because it affects the uh, the fibr uh, the fibrin and the fibrinogen pathway. Another study, uh, they're trying to uh, create one of what we call the uh, trying to call the ideal barrier. The last thing that also they tried, also they tried the honey, uh, Manuka honey, and they tried, they, in this study, they tried to, to say uh, it worked and uh, it, they found it in the, uh, they tried on the animals and they found it, it has some uh, sort of decreasing the, uh, the chance of the fibrosis in, in those, uh, uh, in those uh, animals. So in, in, in nutshell, as we say, this is an avoidable uh, complication of bureau fibrosis, an avoidable complication that uh, gonna happen in any surgery and the, the best and the, uh, the most trust avoidable measures, it's proper surgical technique, avoid any extra, uh, manipulation around the spinal cord and the nerve root. Uh, still, there is a couple of researches being conducted to, to see which is the best uh, mechanical, either synthetic or organic barrier that can be used to prevent this uh, complication. All right, thank you for that presentation. Um, actually, I enjoyed the part about um, honey being used as a treatment because of the healing properties that honey has, has um, for different things. And, um, and I love bees, so let's save the bees. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, we have a, uh, a question from Hisong. Forgive me if I didn't pronounce that uh, correctly. Um, he asked, in abdominal surgery, if the adhesion does not form in the first week, it generally won't form in the future. Does such critical timing window exist for a dural fibrosis? Uh, so most, most of the, oh, I'll go back to this uh, slide, which is the pathway of the fibrosis. So it's all about understanding this. So most of the healing, uh, they found it, it's happened within the, the first 
the first two weeks of any injury. So if the fibrosis didn't have, so if the, uh, if, as you see in the screen, if the scale goes toward the, the green side, that's definitely they will have normal healing. But if there's any break or any uh, inhibition for any of those checkpoints could happen due to uh, infection, could happen due to uh, 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 any irritant material between the two row servers. So that's the, the fibros will be organized to, toward the scar. And at that time, once the scar happened, there will be no remodelation and the, uh, and that, that organized uh, fibrous tissue will end up with the scar. And at, at that point, you, there, is no, there is no way for our body to take care of that, uh, to that scar. Oh, yes. Um, uh, 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 thank you, doctor, for the, um, uh, for the great uh, presentation. Um, uh, I had a question on, um, uh, I read that um, uh, stretching with physical therapy may help a little bit and um, gabapentin may help a little bit. And I was wondering if, um, uh, if, if you can shed some light on it. Like if, if, if you send someone to physical therapy uh, by like how much time, you know, would you see some benefit if, if, if benefit is to come? And for gabapentin, um, any thoughts on, you know, what would be the good dose uh, and duration for that? And um, in terms of, uh, you know, I see a few patients with gabapentin in the, here in the wellness clinic. And I, I just wanted to get an idea on if someone's on gabapentin because of some post-surgical pain, is this something where they may uh, eventually their body may adapt and they, they, they may not need it as much like after some time, or is it something that, that, uh, that, that, that it doesn't adapt and you just keep needing it? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the, uh, for uh, actually uh, for this question. It's a, uh, it's a matter of timing. So uh, stretching definitely helped uh, because uh, uh, especially earlier, after, uh, like before that scar, as we say, before the scar got, before the fibrous tissue got organized to be scarred, the sooner uh, uh, physical therapy after, after the surgery, the better. And the, how, how long you do the, the, the physical therapy, because it's just, imagine this is on a scar. So if you let that scar to end up stiff, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get the benefit of the motion. But if you stretch that scar still, as, as we talked in that slide, that scar, that fibro, fibro uh, blast, it has still in the uh, early stages could be stretched and and that that will uh, that will have gain uh, give some some support uh, stretching that will give some um, range of motion. But about the question of the gap benton, the most of the studies they 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 see that the benefit will be uh, in the early uh, stages after the uh, fibrosis happens. Because what happened, the nerve, the nerve, uh, the nerve root, when it exits from uh, on the foramen, if that if that narrowing uh, will make more irritation for the nerve, and the gabapentin it held in that in that specific uh, situation, because the that will uh, decrease the irritation, so that's gonna decrease the pain that the patient will experience. But as he as he mentioned, I agree. Uh, physical therapy, long physical therapy, and uh, um, some medications like gabapentin will help decrease the pain of the patient with the uh, with the epidural fibrosis. Thank you. So we have another question um, from your clinical from your clinical experience. How well does the current anti adhesion products work? Uh, from my uh, I will say from my experience, uh, I will, I've been uh, 
we've been using a couple of, as you say, we didn't have any uh, mechanical barriers being approved to be used by the FDA in the US. But from what we've been using, we've been using the free fat, uh, fat graft. Uh, I didn't do my, uh, we didn't conduct a study in our hospital about this because some surgeons they're using it, some they still don't believe in it. Uh, as it's been in the literature as, uh, when we show that. And uh, some, they're using gel foam. Some surgeons, uh, they use the uh, uh, local steroids. So all, uh, as uh, if we go and go back here, sorry. As it's been on all over the world, the literature, some they support it, some they don't, they don't see any, uh, any difference in, in using uh, either of those uh, barriers. But as a synthetic one till now, we, we don't have anything approved in the US to be used uh, by, uh, uh, by the FDA. Okay, thank you. We have uh, another question from one of our newest uh, neurosurgeons, Dr. Torquator. Um, he said, he asked any role of vitamin E and pentafoxifilin as a medical opinion? Did I totally butcher that? Yeah, yep, yeah. <laughs> that's close enough. Okay. That's, that's uh, I will go back to uh, one of the slides that I mentioned the vitamin E because it's been used, it's the same theory, like we, uh, the dermatologists, they've been using vitamin E for uh, decades now. And they believe it's gonna uh, decrease the the uh, the thickness or uh, of the, the or the uh, roughness of the skin. So it's the same. Uh, it's been the same. They've been using the same theory in a couple of studies for that, and uh, for a uh, uh, couple of other uh, immunomodulators that have been uh, published. But all of those. Uh, uh, chemical agents being used on animals. There is no, I didn't come across to any study that uh, been uh, using uh, either uh, uh, vitamin E or uh, tamoxifene or uh, any other chemical agents on, on, a, on a humans yet. Like the, the most, the most uh, chemical agent that's being tested uh, at least on a human is it's the uh, MMC. But uh, some, some uh, literature, they say there is uh, being a lot of complications, which is the thinning of the dura. They found it in, uh, in, uh, after, after using the MC, and there's a higher chance of the uh, uh, spinal fluid leak after using the MC in those cases. And they prove it even, they supported their, uh, uh, their theory with the, from, uh, with the, with the uh, studies that done in the ophthalmologist because they've been, uh, the MC being used in the ophthalmologist uh, for a while and they found it in that the studies that there is increased risk of the uh, uh, corneal uh, perforation or thinning of the, of the sclera. So it's been the same, uh, some complications documented in the spinal ward too, which is mainly the spinal uh, uh, fluid leak. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, please uh, come forward with those. And if not, uh, we're gonna call it, uh, call it, call it the end of the presentation. All right. It doesn't look like we have any more. So I want to thank everyone and uh, and uh, Dr. Balesha for giving this presentation, and thank everyone for joining us. Um, as I said last time, be sure to follow us on social media. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And we will be posting this lecture on our social platforms so you can rewatch it. Okay. Thank you guys and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you for having me.